So this is a new 16-inch MacBook Pro from Apple. And right over here, we have the ProArt StudioBook 16 OLED from Asus. And I'm gonna compare how each machine can handle professional applications that I use on a daily basis here in the studio. I'm also gonna be including some other real-world tests like Houdini, Maya, and a few others. I'll also talk about battery life and how it's just like to use these laptops every day. Spec-wise, the StudioBook is loaded as it features AMD's Ryzen 9 CPU, 32 gigabytes of RAM, two terabytes of SSDs in RAID, an RTX 3070, and a beautiful 4K OLED display. Most notably, a really cool addition to this laptop is an interactive dial that's supposed to help you with your creative apps. And all of this goodness is gonna cost you 2,500 US dollars. On the other hand, we have the MacBook Pro, which comes with Apple's custom design processor called the M1 Pro with 10 cores, 32 gigabytes of RAM, a one terabyte SSD, a 16 core GPU that's part of the chip, and a liquid Retina XDR display with 120 Hertz adaptive refresh rate. And this spec is gonna cost you, wait for it, 3,100 US dollars. As Dimitri would say, that's a lot of ka -chings. Look. These are two different laptops running two different specs and most importantly, running two completely different operating systems. But I wanted to get a sense of what both these machines uh, can offer for creative professionals out there who are shopping around for a portable workstation uh, that can adapt easily. We have one of the best from the PC side and the best from Apple running Mac OS that I personally have been enjoying lately. So let's get started with the most obvious design and build quality. The StudioBook 16 comes in this clean matte black finish that speaks to people who love stealth vibes. The etched ProArt logo on the front lid is a nice touch and the entire chassis, including the bottom panel, is made out of anodized aluminum and it feels like a rock, guys. This is by far the best built Windows laptop that I've ever got my hands on. Um, there are no signs of keyboard flex, let alone any traces of plastic components. So it's a worthy rival uh, to the MacBook Pro. The hinge is really smooth and you can open it with one hand. Plus it doesn't really wobble. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the chassis loves fingerprints. So it's gonna be a bit of a challenge to keep it clean. The MacBook Pro takes things to a whole new level, guys. First of all, it's an all new design uh, compared to the previous generation uh, with a more boxier look. I have the silver model, but you can pick it up in space gray. And the entire chassis is made out of 100% recycled unibody aluminum construction. So it's built really well. Uh, and you can always expect that sort of quality from Apple. It also does a much better job at resisting fingerprints compared to the StudioBook. The hinge is strong and very smooth to open. And I just love how flush the front lid sits on the main frame. And it just makes a world of a difference when you're handling, uh, because with the StudioBook, you can still feel the gap uh, around when you wrap your hands around the body. And Honestly, it's just a little attentive to details that make Apple stand out from the crowd. Now, before I get into the dimensions and all the other details, let's take a quick look at today's video sponsor. The NZXT capsule microphone. Get the best airflow for your vocal experience with a modular pop-out chamber to simplify installation on and off the bass. Control the gain for best volume RPM in a package that looks this good with USB-C and headphone input IO with a true unbox plug and play solution for your loud thoughts to shine. The capsule sounds pretty neutral as you can hear, plus it's a good place to start if you plan to overclock with EQ later. Check out the NZXT capsule black or white down below. So we've established that both these laptops are built really well, but what about portability? Well, the StudioBook 16 is slightly larger than the MacBook Pro, even though both of them feature a 16 inch display. Um, I had no issues fitting the MacBook Pro inside my backpack, whereas the StudioBook had a lot of trouble doing that. The Z height is thinner on the MacBook Pro coming in at 0.61 inches or 15.5 millimeters versus 0.84 inches or 21.4 millimeters on the StudioBook. The MacBook Pro is also the lightest in this comparison. Uh, we're talking around 0.6 pounds of difference, which might now sound like a lot on paper, but you can actually certainly feel the difference when you're holding these two side by side. Now check this out, guys. This is the included 240 watt power adapter that comes with the StudioBook 16. And this is what comes with the new 16 inch MacBook Pro. I mean, the difference in form factor is massive. Albeit you're getting a 140 watt adapter with the Mac, but still it's smaller than my phone and the cable is removable. Uh, plus I can easily toss it into my backpack and not worry about space. Whereas with the StudioBook, I'll certainly need to shop around for a bigger backpack that can fit both the laptop and the power cord properly. Oh, and this is also my first time experiencing MagSafe charging for the Mac, and I'm genuinely impressed with this feature. It just snaps onto the charging port of the laptop, and it's pretty strong, and there is an LED indicator that shows the status of charging. It's fast, it's super convenient, and 
I'm so glad Apple brought that back to the newer MacBooks. The StudioBook, on the other hand, uses the standard barrel style connector that uh, we're used to. And I'm not particularly a fan of this placement because it gets in the way of the USB port, which can get a lot annoying at times. The interior space on the StudioBook is pretty clean and simple. You get a full-size keyboard that includes a numpad. The dedicated arrow keys are textured for quick distinction. The key travel is shallow, but uh, they still manage to provide good feedback and there's less rattling with the keys. The MacBook Pro comes with a standard layout along with smaller arrow keys, which might cause an issue for people who rely on them regularly. The key travel is slightly shorter than the StudioBook, but it can deliver good feedback and satisfying actuation when you bottom out. And I also noticed that it's a bit quieter than the StudioBook. The secondary commands on the function row on both laptops act as primary, so you can adjust them on the fly. And both of them are backlit. The MacBook Pro actually automatically adjusts brightness based on ambient lighting, and there's no manual control. Whereas with the StudioBook, you do have that feature where you can adjust brightness manually. Okay, let's take a second to talk about Touch ID. Now, this is Apple's secure fingerprint authentication system that not only lets you log into the computer, but it also verifies payments using Apple Pay. Um, it can also be used to turn on the device, and it is ridiculously fast. Just a gentle tap will just do the trick, whereas the StudioBook, even though it has one, it takes a few seconds to log in. Moving on to the trackpads, both of them feature precision glass, but when it comes to overall smoothness and responsiveness, I have to give it to the MacBook Pro. For starters, you're getting a really large surface area to work with. Navigating within macOS and third-party apps like DaVinci Resolve makes you feel more connected with the content, and it's something that I've never experienced on a Windows laptop. Simple gestures like zooming in and scrolling are that being said, the StudioBook has a few more tricks up its sleeve, like this unique three-button touchpad that is specifically designed for 3D artists who need a middle button to function as pan, rotate, or orbit. Plus, it has stylus support for 1,024 pressure sensitivity points. So you can use something like this to translate your natural writing or artistic abilities into a digital portfolio. Pretty cool in my opinion. To complement that, ASUS has included a physical dial that gives you precise control over adjusting different parameters within applications like After Effects, Photoshop, Premiere, and Lightroom. This is an excellent tool for creators, and I appreciate ASUS for thinking outside the box. Support for third-party apps is still in the works, but as of right now, if you're a heavy Adobe user, this will certainly come in clutch. Port selection on both laptops is pretty good. The StudioBook has two USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C ports, a couple more USB Type-P ports, an audio jack, RJ45, HDMI 2.1, and a full-size SD Express 7.0 card reader. That's actually much faster than UHS-2, which is awesome. The MacBook Pro has three Thunderbolt 4 ports, HDMI 2.0, and an audio jack, and an SD XE card reader, and that's it. So you're definitely getting more flexibility with a StudioBook in terms of connectivity, and not to mention, you don't have to worry about external display constraints like the MacBook has, uh, because the M1 Pro chip can only support up to two 6K monitors at 60 Hertz, whereas the StudioBook uh, can do up to three. Now, just to let you know, the M1 Max chip can do three displays, but we're working with what we have here, folks. Actually, speaking of displays, let's talk about what you're getting out of the box. The StudioBook 16 comes with a 4K OLED 16x10 screen, and the MacBook Pro comes with a slightly bigger 16.2, almost 4K display, because the resolution's a little bit weird, as you can see. But I've got to say, both these laptops bring tears to my eyes. First of all, having that larger aspect ratio gives you more room for content, and secondly, the color reproduction is delightful on both. The StudioBook covers 100% sRGB, 96% Adobe RGB, and 100% DCI-P3. Um, it's what you would expect from an OLED panel. The MacBook Pro is pretty close to those numbers, and given that it's using a mini LED panel, one of the advantages of using this tech is you now have 120 hertz adaptive refresh rate, or as Apple would call it, ProMotion. In short, it just gives you a smoother experience when you're interacting with content versus 60 hertz on the StudioBook, though I will say that Asus is offering a quad HD IPS option with 120 hertz refresh rate, so it'll be a similar experience to the MacBook. Um, as for brightness levels, the Mac was able to sustain a peak brightness level of 530 nits versus 400 on the StudioBook. Either way, you're not gonna go wrong with these displays for any sort of creative work. Now, if you're looking to upgrade these laptops, you might be a bit disappointed with the MacBook Pro because everything, including the memory and storage, is soldered onto the PCB. So when you're configuring this laptop, through Apple's website, just make sure you choose what you really need. Uh, side note, 
I just want to take a second to admire this beautiful layout that Apple has engineered. It's so clean and photogenic. Let me know if you agree with me in the comments. Uh, switching over to the Studio Book, uh, things are easily accessible. You get two SODIMM slots with a maximum supported memory of 64 gigabytes, and there are two M.2 slots for storage expansion. If you're wondering about SSD performance on both these laptops, here are the numbers. Uh, keep note that I used Amorphous Dismark, which is an equivalent test for Crystal Dismark on the PC. AJA basically dumps a 64 gigabyte 5K clip to the drive and it measures its read and write speeds. All right, so if you need to upgrade your storage for your laptop, uh, let's take a second here to talk about the new Western Digital SN570 NVMe SSD. Now, by using a controller built by WD themselves, it can actually offer a huge leap in performance over traditional hard drives. And that's a big deal for creators who rely on quick access to key projects in Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve, or multitasking uh, in their content creation workflows. I live this on a daily basis since I'm working with multiple projects and programs open at the same time. And guys, let me tell you, it is so important to have a great, reliable storage system in those cases. Uh, the SN570 also includes a copy of Acronis True Image Software, which is a great little program that allows you to back up everything from a few project files to an entire operating system. Also, for a limited time, WD is also throwing in a month of free access to Adobe's Creative Cloud Services, a great way to start creating content. Uh, but the biggest focus for this SSD is about offering a combination of durability, efficiency, and performance wrapped up into a package that doesn't really break the bank. So make sure to check out the SN570 down in the description. Back to the video. Now, how are the built-in speakers on these laptops? Well, after listening to them back to back, I think the MacBook Pro sounds tremendously better than the Studio Book. The treble sound detailed without any harshness, and there's proper depth to the bass response. It's the best speaker that I've come across on a laptop so far. The Studio Book is good with detailed troubles, but the lack of bass just makes anything sound incomplete. This is the webcam test on the Studio Book 16 OLED. Uh, the resolution is 720p, so it's not necessarily the most detailed. Uh, my vocals or the microphone quality is pretty good because ASUS has built in their own characteristics, so it's very much more um, natural and more detailed. Whereas if I switch over to the MacBook Pro, uh, the quality is a little bit better because it is using a 1080p sensor, and I do like the skin tones. There's not a lot of overexposure with my face. Um, everything looks great. Even the microphone sounds really, really good. All right, folks, I think it's time to talk about performance. This is the part that I was super excited about because on one hand, we have a really powerful 8-core 16-thread processor uh, from AMD paired with a 110 watt RTX 3070. And on the other side, we have the M1 Pro, which is a 10-core CPU with eight performance cores and two efficiency cores paired with a 16-core GPU and a dedicated media encoding engine. We ran a bunch of real-world tests to see which one was faster, and the results might really surprise you. Quick disclaimer, the Studio Book was set to performance mode and the MacBook Pro, well, it doesn't really have any modes since it's ready to shoot for the stars right away. Starting with Citibench R23, we ran a 10-minute multi-core stress test. And as you can see, the Ryzen CPU is slightly faster than the MacBook Pro, but by not all that much. On the other hand, single core performance favors the M1 Pro. Next up, we have Blender, where we ran two scenes and the results are, once again, very close between the two laptops. Sure, the Ryzen CPU led by a few seconds, but realistically, that time is negligible. Now, I should mention that Apple's transition to ARM is far from complete, since there are plenty of pro apps that still require optimizations. Some of them already have native support, but others are still relying on Rosetta 2.0, which is a software built into macOS that allows applications designed for x86 and x64 based processors to run on ARM. Here's a good example. Houdini is a 3D modeling software that's also used for VFX. And while it's not optimized for M1, the MacBook Pro still managed to beat the Ryzen CPU by 20 seconds. Switching to Autodesk Maya, the M1 Pro falls behind the 5900HX. But remember, these apps are running on Rosetta 2.0. So imagine the story after they're optimized. What about photo editing? Because I shoot a lot of raw images that needs adjustments for creating thumbnails and posting on social media. I primarily use Photoshop and Lightroom for these tasks. And once again, 
both these laptops can handle that process no problem. The Puget benchmark that I ran on Photoshop was using Rosetta 2 on the Mac, though keep in mind that this app is already optimized for M1. I just wasn't able to find a good test. The Lightroom test was pretty simple. I took 100 raw thumbnail photos from my Canon EOS R camera and I exported them to JPEG at 100% quality and the MacBook Pro was 11 seconds faster. What about video editing or even transcoding? Well, our 13-minute 4K H.264 export with heavy color grading and effects rendered a little bit faster on the StudioBook, but when you switch to DaVinci Resolve Studio, which is my primary NLE, it favored the MacBook Pro. But once again, these results are very close to each other, guys. Then I took a 10-minute 4K MP4 clip and transcoded it to MKV using Handbrake. And what do you know, folks? Both these machines completed that task at the same time. Last thing I want to go over is battery life. The StudioBook has a 90 watt hour battery and the MacBook Pro has a slightly bigger cell coming in at 99.9 watt hours. Both are heavy and light load tests favor the MacBook Pro, but keep in mind that for the light load test, Chrome uses a lot of system resources. So if I were to use Safari, I would have been able to extend battery life. Something I noticed is that the standby time on the MacBook Pro is much better compared to the StudioBook. If I were to put the Mac to sleep at 50%, wake up the next day, it's gonna remain at 50%. Whereas with the StudioBook, uh, expect it to drop or about five to 7%. So I really have to give credit to Apple for efficiency. Speaking of which, I was actually really curious to see how these machines would perform with 60% battery left. And the results, were absolutely mind-blowing. Check this out, guys. The MacBook Pro managed to maintain its peak performance just as if it was plugged in, whereas the StudioBook just fell off the cliff uh, since the CPU wasn't able to maintain higher clock speeds, which resulted in longer render times. Also, take a listen to this. So yeah, the MacBook Pro is dead silent, whereas the StudioBook sounds like a jet fan. There's just no competition. What's even impressive is the power efficiency of the new Mac. I mean, being able to achieve top tier multi-core performance while sucking less than half the power that the StudioBook draws just goes to show how ARM is the future of computing. And Apple has delivered high performance and efficiency with the new M1 Pro chip. And that's something that both Intel and AMD have to work on. Surface temperatures are also a lot lower on the MacBook Pro. Uh, I was actually thinking to myself, am I even pushing this laptop to its limit? So here's the thing. If you're a creator looking for a mobile workstation, both the StudioBook 16 OLED and the 16-inch MacBook Pro are great options. Uh, they're the best of both worlds. But I approach this comparison with a simple question. Which one of these laptops would handle my workflow really well and efficiently? And I have to say, the MacBook Pro stole my heart. It's easier to carry around. I absolutely love the trackpad. The display is smooth and bright. The speakers sound amazing. I mean, seriously, I can comfortably rely on these for editing videos. The battery life is better. And lastly, the performance just seals the deal. The only problem is the price. I mean, spending $3,000 on a laptop, it just hurts your wallet. But I see it as an investment because if it can fill the void between a desktop and a laptop, then why not? And I know this video focuses on the professional aspects of both these laptops, but I still need to mention gaming because it's one area that Windows laptops has a better ecosystem than Apple's. I mean, it's not like the MacBook Pro can't game. There's plenty of Mac OS supported games on Steam and you can easily use a streaming service like Nvidia's GeForce Now. Plus over the fall, Steam was updated to natively support ARM and that could be a pretty big deal for gaming guys. But right now there's just a whole lot more and newer titles available for Windows. On that note, thank you so much for watching. Let us know what you guys think about this comparison and stay tuned for more content revolving around this new MacBook Pro from Apple. Uh, I've been using this thing for the past three months and I'm absolutely loving it. Definitely stay tuned for my long-term experience of this guy, which is coming very shortly. That's gonna be fun. But yeah, that's it for me, guys. I'll talk to you guys in the next one.